tonight the topic is going to be on utility and the rate payer. If you're curious about uh, these slides, they do have links in them and you can follow along with them right here. And well, all right, let's get started. First, I want to thank our sponsors, Sacramento State, the College of Engineering and Computer Science, SMUD, Weintraub Tobin, Blue Tech Valley, and Moss Adams. And now we seem to be fine on the slides. All right. So I would like to welcome our panel, Dr. Karen Herter, founder and director of Herter Energy and Research Solutions, Tanya Barham, um, CEO and of Community Energy Labs, Ryan Bross, uh, senior project manager at SMUD. And first I would like to welcome Karen Herter, PhD. Karen Herter is the founder and director of Herter Energy Research and Solutions. Since 1995, Karen has worked with government utilities, universities, national labs, nonprofits, and technology vendors to push the envelope in smart, sustainable energy production and consumption through research, technology development, and customer education. She holds a BA in mathematics and psychology, an MS in environmental stu studies, and a PhD in energy and resources. Her company's work continues to set the standard for smart grid implementation, research in California and worldwide. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share and let her take it away. Yeah. All right, so today I'm gonna to talk very briefly about some of the field studies that I did. Um, as Thomas said, I've been in this field for over 20 years and um, it was hard to choose. So I, I tried to focus on some of the technology studies that I've done over the last couple of decades. And um, some of the best ones, my favorite ones uh, were done for SMUD, in SMUD in Sacramento Service Territory. And so um, there are four that I'm gonna talk about today. And the first is a small commercial study that involved time of use rates and advanced thermostats. The second is a residential study, very similar, um, that has time of use rates and advanced thermostats. Uh, the third one, uh, also at SMUD, is a residential pre-cooling thermostat. This was a load control study, so it was much more controlled in terms of what we did with customers' thermostats, whereas the first two were more, uh, we gave the customer control over their own thermostat. And then the fourth one uh, is a thermostat usability study where I took you know, 12 advanced thermostats and put them on a wall and invited hundreds of customers in to play with them. We recorded it and got some really interesting results. Um, as I looked at this old slide today, I realized that I had an old icon of a man, um, the, the program manager putting the open ADR signal into the computer, but since that was me, uh, I, I updated it with, with my face. Um, so the small commercial price response study, essentially we got, uh, I think it was around 80 small commercial customers. There was retail, office, and restaurants. And we provided them with a thermostat that was able to receive a radio signal from our local radio station. And I worked with um, uh, e-radio who set up a server at the local public radio station to receive. And then I worked with the Open ADR Alliance to create a translation from the Open ADR signal, which I had there on my little uh, laptop, my thermostat, uh, my computer. Um, to link that up with a radio signal that was sent to the thermostats. And that translation still exists. So if we wanted to, we could still send these auto DR signals, this open ADR signal to um, public service, uh, public radio stations that um, sends the signal out then to, you can see all of these little buildings. These were small commercial buildings, again, offices, retail and restaurants. And what it did was told them, look, between, um, between I believe it was 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. in SMUD, the rate is going to be much higher. In fact, it was 75 cents per kilowatt hour uh, on certain days. And we called 15 events over the course of the summer. And, and then on, time, on regular days, they, were, um, they had a time of use rate. Uh, and so they, we provided them with a simple pre-cooling schedule that they could simply in the menu button say, yes, please pre-cool before my peak period, and that saved them money during their peak period. So that was the technology. Uh, customers programmed their own temperature preferences uh, to respond to this critical peak rate. We did recommend four degrees, but they were able to change it to whatever they wanted it to be. 
So the results of the study showed that for office buildings, we got significant demand response during critical peak days, um, up to 37% bill savings for those customers that included not just the demand response, but also the savings that they received by reducing their peak loads uh, during the high time of use rate. And there was a significant energy efficiency uh, savings, as you can see here, 27%. And this was mainly because many of the customers that took uh, that signed up for this program had manual thermostats. Um, they're tenants in these, um, you know, strip mall buildings. So when we offer the programmable thermostat, a lot of them jumped on it because they said, I don't have any opportunity. Sometimes I forget to turn it off at night and then I get charged um, for electricity that I, you know, I'm using and I don't need. So we got really good results from office. Um, excellent results from retail as well, although a little bit lower, but in both cases, over 30% demand response for those events, those 15 events per year. And then in restaurants, you can see that savings were, were much smaller, but still significant on a dollar basis for this bill savings of 13%, because restaurant electricity bills are very, very high because they have such high AC loads. So they were actually thrilled, the few that we got to sign up, um, mainly with their energy uh, efficiency and bill savings. Um, so that was a very successful study. The next study uh, was a residential price response. And it was similar um, in the sense that it was an open ADR input to, um, in this case, not a radio signal, but an internet signal, which you might expect. Um, this was uh, 2011, 2012. And so many customers, residential customers have the internet and they were capable of installing this. This was a tiny little um, router that we used to communicate to their thermostat using Z-Wave. And the same basic idea, we asked customers to pre-cool and we asked um, them to choose a response to a critical peak price. So a 75 cent per kilowatt hour price. There were 12 events over, over two summers. In each of two summers, we had 12 events and again, customers were um, uh, educated on how to uh, set up their thermostats to respond to the signal with a, a recommended response of four degrees that could be changed at any time. Um, we got um, even better results from the residential sector. They uh, provided a 58, almost a 60% res demand response during those critical peak events. Their efficiency savings were lower because many of them, of course, already had programmable thermostats. Um, the efficiency savings we suspect came mainly from the education efforts that went along with this pilot study. And the bill savings were significant. Uh, again, um, and when I, I have so many more results that I could show you, but my time is limited. Basically, the bulk of these savings came from customers responding by pre-cooling before the time of use peak every single day, every weekday, and then letting their temperature float by a couple of degrees during the peak period. And that afforded them a, a good window, a three hour window for many of them, two to three hours of no air conditioning running during that high peak um, daily peak period, which I believe was 27 cents for just the daily peak, as opposed to the 75 cents for the event peak. Um, you can see compared to the tiered rate, which as most of you know in California are going away, the time of use rate was much more successful. Um, even, even compared to load control, which gave us 30% when we controlled their thermostat and um, they, uh, on, a, on a regular day, they got much, much greater savings than did the tiered rate. So what this looks like, the residential study, if you look at it on, this is what they would normally do. So the folks on the tiered rate on a normal day, on average summer weekday, of course they didn't respond during the peak period because they had no reason to. They were on a flat rate. There was no rate price increase during the peak. The folks that were on the, the time of use rate, um, every single day they responded by dropping load during those three peak hours and there was significant savings, um, both in terms of kilowatts, which you can see almost a full kilowatt of savings every single day during the summer. Uh, and as you can imagine, that um, provided substantial bill savings as well. The third study um, briefly is, was a residential pre-cooling where we controlled the thermostat for the customer just so we could compare different levels of 
um, of response. There were three different versions that we tried of control. The first was um, uh, just load shed during the peak. The second was a two hour pre-cooling followed by a load shed. And the one that I'm showing here was the most successful was a six hour, a very shallow pre-cool of just two degrees. So maybe normally I set my thermostat at 74 during the day. In the morning, uh, these customers would set it to 72 instead of 74, right? So it's slightly cooler. You can see that the energy use is higher because it's cooler. And then during this demand response, well, it's not even a demand response period. This is just a time of use. Um, uh, sorry, uh, this is a demand response of three degrees offset during the peak period. And we got um, over a kilowatt from um, this uh, load shed during the peak and provided the pre-cooling. We did surveys that showed that customers who had this pre-cooling were much more comfortable during the event because their homes were cooler. Um, and, and that's just an intuitive response. But um, the point here really is thermostats right now don't make this simple. So for any of you out there who are thinking about creating a thermostat, I would highly recommend you consider making pre-cooling easy for customers, especially um, if they're on a time of use rate so that they can shed during the peak and save extra money um, in this way. Finally, the last study I'm gonna go over is a usability study, um, again, in conjunction with SMUD, where we looked at 12 communicating thermostats and uh, kudos to the SMUD team on all of these studies. Uh, they were just an amazing group to work with, um, so forward thinking and um, helpful. And so um, I had, a, a, some cubicles built. We had one thermostat in each cubicle with task list and the report has all of the details of the study. Um, invited 155 participants to come in. Each customer tested two thermostats which allowed them to compare them. Which one did they like better? And with very complicated um, uh, um, structure of, of, of customers you know, pairing of customers with thermostats, you know, first this one, then that one, and then the second participant would do this one first and then that one to make sure that there was a statistically um, significant, um, uh, or a, a good statistical analysis. We were able to um, get really good statistically significant results showing that a larger screen and fewer menu steps, again, pretty intuitive, improve usability. And by usability, we actually measured the amount of time that it took them to complete a set of tasks. And um, what uh, improved the survey responses for which one did they like better? Larger menu text and, uh, and e higher usability, uh, which also makes sense. It was easier to use, they liked it more, but even though larger menu text did not affect the usability of the thermostat, people just liked it. They just preferred it. Other things that affected uh, what they liked is how it looked and how it felt and how it sounded. Um, kind of an interesting uh, outcome. And then um, finally, I wanted to just give a summary by providing recommendations. Um, you know, what we're working, of course, I work now, I'm on a, a two year gig with a, the Energy Commission to help them um, create load management standards to implement all of this research that's been done over the last two decades uh, and to help vendors um, and third party service providers by creating, um, first of all, time varying rates. And we do have time of use rates. We're working towards real time rates. So they're hourly 15 minute, five minute rates that technology can really take advantage of and automate customer loads to reduce their builds and to make the grid more stable. Um, next, what I'm working on is to create a freely available machine readable database of time varying rates so that technologies by vendors can access this database and push out um, schedules and control strategies to technologies to help customers keep their bills low on these time varying rates. Um, and then finally, in California at least, advanced thermostats seem like the clear winner in terms of which technology is the first one to address. Um, AC loads are the highest loads in California. And these can be scheduled and managed by either customers or their automation service providers. They don't need to be controlled by the utilities, although we, of course, will, you know, I'm sure going forward, make use of those programs as well to pre-cool when electricity is cheap, 
when renewables are plentiful and to float the temperature when prices are high and um, demand is high and prices on the wholesale market are expensive. And um, nice to have uh, for the utilities to have rate comparisons or third party service providers compare how the bills will look on different rates. We found that on-site audits were very, very helpful for customers to give them just a 30 minute um, uh, in-person, I know that's hard now, but in-person review of what they're missing, what's their insulation look like, what can they do to make things better. Assistance with improving their attic insulation and their thermostat selection, installation and scheduling. And, you know, totally optional, but nice to have for some people, real-time energy data. We didn't find that there was much of an effect, but there was a very small effect. You can review this in your free time, but this is just a Venn diagram showing, here's some efficient technologies. Technologies you can just schedule, a timer, a delay start appliance to avoid that peak price. And then of course, responsive technologies that are connected to the internet or maybe receive a signal a public uh, notification of prices. And there are all of these interactions in the middle is really the sweet spot, sweet spot where you can find advanced uh, electric vehicle chargers, water heaters, pool and spa controls, outlets and thermostats. Um, thank you so much. I, I'm a, sorry that that was so fast, but um, I had so much to, to share. I hope that wasn't overwhelming. Thomas, oh. what I do? You did excellent. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to now move on to our next presenter. All right. <laughs> Just uh, get myself ready here. Mm -hmm. um, also, thanks everyone for being here. I see some, you know, I always feel a little guilty when um, I see people who I know have heard this talk like a hundred times. <laughs> I'm just like, aren't you sick of me yet? I'm sick of me. Um, and also my dad's on this call. So this is a, lots of things are coming together tonight for me. I'm also a fangirling all over the place about being on the same panel as Karen Herter. So please uh, excuse my like, whoo, my nerves. All right. So I'm going to talk to you tonight. I've had a lot of different lives. Um, and I'll show you my screen in just one second. I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of stalling. Um, uh, for the past, between 2016 and 2019, so I've done a lot of um, technology, R&D, innovation to market in the energy and healthcare spaces. In 2016, I sold a company and I came back to PECI, which is the nation's first energy conservation program. So just like climate action plans are to communities today, uh, energy conservation plans were in the late 70s, early 80s. So PECI was the nation's first in Portland, Oregon. Uh, spun off as a nonprofit. I was employee number 35 there. I worked on scaling a large HVAC, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning optimization software platform before starting my own company. Well, in 2014, they sold all of their assets and said, how can we help? What can we do in our nonprofit mission? Uh, they tapped me on the shoulder after they heard that I'd sold my company and said, can you come back and do what you did with AirCare Plus in this new realm of grid modernization and communities? Where can we find benefits? So we interviewed at the time about 94 communities. We did primary and secondary research and said, where is the opportunity for us to really make an impact in terms of helping these communities, all of which had signed resolutions saying they wanted to get to 100% clean and renewable energy or completely decarbonize, which is all very cute, except for that most of them had zero control over where their energy came from because those decisions are made by state regulatory agencies and their utilities. So we looked at, you know, there was a concept around what if we used microgrids or what are our pathways to decarbonization if communities want to speed up decarbonization or take matters into their own hands. And we adopted sort of two, two areas of practice that really took off. One won the Smart Electric Power Alliance Visionary of the Year Award in 2019. And that was a technology consulting practice which came up with a methodology to help utility distribution system planners and local officials join hands and think about smart portfolios of financeable and technically feasible projects that they could use to quickly decarbonize locally. But this creates some issues at what we call the edge of the grid. The grid as a physics-based system was never really meant to accommodate 
you know, your solar pumping out in the middle of the day and then big draws from your electric vehicle at other times of the day or discharge and charge from a battery. So we started looking at that and saying, wow, there's a whole suite of technical solutions that need to be able to do a whole bunch of weird things that the grid was never meant to do. They need to do it autonomously. They need to do it at time scales that, you know, it's great if it's a three hour demand response program, but increasingly there might be shorter time scales or voltage um, and other capacity issues that need to be addressed. And when we looked at the value to homeowners and building owners, we saw, oh, wow, like the average savings per household is something like $25 a month, which is not necessarily super motivating. So we got really curious about how we could implement these automation technologies for building owners in a way that would be able to help buildings do a bunch of things autonomously. Shift loads, like Karen was talking about, preheating and pre-cooling, water heating, changing the amperage of vehicles, et cetera. And so I'm gonna tell you about one solution that PECI spun off into Community Energy Labs, which is the company that I'm now the CEO and founder of. Um, so this is uh, partly our pitch deck. I hope you don't mind, and I hope you find it inspiring and interesting. Um, let me share my screen now. Look at that. Uh, also, this is Oregon, by the way. I know all of you from California want to, wanted to move here anyway, but <laughs> now you'll extra double want to move here. Okay. So uh, at Community Energy Labs, we are bringing to market the first truly scalable AI powered clean building control system. So I'm Tanya Barham, if we hadn't already established that. One tenth of US greenhouse gas emissions come from direct combustion of gas in buildings, your water heat, your furnace and your water heat. 93% of commercial buildings use fossil fuels to heat water and air. But communities worldwide, and California is really at the forefront of this, are pushing buildings to convert to electric to while they convert to electric, actually operate more efficiently, so use less energy overall, and consume power when renewables are making it. So CEL's AI-powered clean building control was purpose-built to enable this change, not just for the largest and the wealthiest building owners, but for your local school, church, or city hall as well. So getting carbon out of building energy use is not as simple as it sounds. This blue curve is when and how much energy a building is using. The icons are systems that drive energy use. In the morning, the AC comes on, water is heating, and a car is charging. In the afternoon, the AC is working extra hard because people open doors, letting out cold air. And so this shape of building energy use is important because what climate laws try to accomplish in a very simplified format is to get a building's energy shape to line up with this. The green line represents when renewables, in this case solar, are making power. Any energy use that falls under this curve can be met by solar. Any energy use outside of this curve comes from fossil fuels on the grid. That, like I said, oversimplification for those of you that are in the know, but in essence, that's kind of how it goes. So decarbonizing buildings is actually worth 269 billion by 2028, and 8 billion of that is already served. It's everybody and their brother who's scrambling to help wealthy commercial businesses like Google deploy millions for energy analytics and models that will help them understand what kind of upgrades they can put in place to better capture this or to automate that control. But all electric building decarbonization is coming for everyone and Community Energy Labs is aiming to help municipal, university, K through 12 schools and tribal governments who must meet their goals without the ability to pay lots of cash up front. So our extensive work with and sympathy for this segment's struggle to affordably decarbonize is what sets our team apart in this middle market with ambitious building codes. By enabling lower upfront costs and faster returns, we are trying to make clean building optimization affordable and accessible for all building owners. So why is right now the right time to address an underserved market, which has been underserved for some pretty good reasons, actually? Um, Municipalities that pass aggressive building codes often begin by requiring their own facilities be the first to comply with the targets they've set, such as California's plan to decarbonize half of its municipal buildings by 2025. So nearly 100 customer interviews that we did revealed that even with more than half of the commercial floor space in the US, this middle market is still literally wrestling sped spreadsheets and fiddling with thermostats. And just like Karen said, some of these are, are still pneumatic thermostats. They're not even digital, much less automated, preheating, pre-cooling, advanced thermostats. 
That's not to say they couldn't benefit from better technology. If you're a California school superintendent, you might be spending $3 million per year on energy, but upgrades needed to save could cost $3 million up front. They would require months of extensive install and they'd take years to pay back. So we propose an IoT and software as a service control platform for building operators who find it complex, frustrating, and very expensive to meet new building energy goals. We install wireless sensors, equipment controllers, and use cloud-based software powered by machine learning to autonomously predict and efficiently control how and when existing building equipment is operating so that more of it is powered by renewables. And in doing so, we offer building owners higher levels of energy savings, lower carbon and upfront cost, and faster returns than they would if they had to go out and buy all new RTUs or HVAC equipment. Our idea is to charge a one-time fee for a one-day install. Our wireless occupancy sensors and controllers can be retrofitted to existing building equipment. We connect and control devices through a hub, a lot like the one that Karen showed uh, on the wireless, but using cellular because it's super cheap now. We connect and control those devices through that hub and it's the nervous system that sends data to the cloud and that later receives updated control logic for the building from the cloud as it gets to know this building's data better. Once installed, a building owner selects operating preferences and goals like reducing greenhouse gas and saving money. They're then charged a fee to monitor, predict and control energy within those preferences using the machine learning. So with an average savings of 25%, and we've seen in similar technologies in the lab with hardware in the loop and some early field demonstrations that savings can be anywhere from 10 to 25% off the bill. And as Karen showed, if there's a lot of waste in these office and commercial buildings, it can be even higher. With those average savings, many schools in California that have solar would be able to pay back their investment in under two months. Our algorithm updates the control logic on the hub which orchestrates and autonomously controls equipment in real time. And that combination of data plus machine learning leads to deeper insights over time into how a building, equipment, and occupants preferences interact while also responding to their tariff, their rate, the grid signals, or energy pricing. How this works is complex, but to avoid turning this into a lecture on non-parametric, non-linear building models, I'd be happy to answer some of those questions in the panel during Q&A. Let's take a look at how this works. So Kim, and this is literally, <laughs> these are real people that I'm referencing here. I, names have been changed for anonymity, <laughs> but these are real people and real numbers. Kim is the superintendent for a K through 12 school district in California. Her board mandated all facilities be carbon neutral by 2025. So what are her options? Well, the big guys cost millions up front and take months to install, and without custom analytics, they don't reduce carbon. What most middle market customers have is no automation, no analytics, and poor to very little control. So even if CEL's price was right, whatever Kim decides though, she has someone named Glenn, her facility manager, who has to use this. And what we heard from the Glens of the world is, I've got maybe three staff. I'm literally managing all of the facilities in our portfolio and raking mulch. Whatever you do, do not make me look at an analytics dashboard, and by God, do not send me a text at 10 p.m. at night. I do not want text alerts. Just handle it for me. So to meet Glenn's needs, once the IoT hub is connected, the installer walks Glenn through an easy setup. Glenn wants to monitor and control EV, solar, lighting, and water heat. So telling the AI what to optimize is oops, EV, lighting, water heat done. Telling the AI what he wants to optimize, it's pretty simple. Let's just reduce carbon. And what you're seeing here is a live demo with real operational data, logic, and control. So Kim and Glenn see a daily forecast or an historical record of what the AI is doing to their building in real time in order to reduce carbon and save money. Remember when I told you about the renewable curves? This green line here is a live renewable energy forecast for tomorrow from the California grid. The blue line is output from our AI engine that's predicting how much energy the building will use tomorrow. This is based on three years of historical usage from the building and it predicts the load curve with about 80% accuracy. Glenn can see how his building's going to be run, what control decisions the AI is making and why and can override them. But because none of us have time to wait around all day to see how this works, watch the man behind the curtain here. Here it comes into focus. Look at, whoa, the AI, will it work? Okay. Um, 
we're going to talk about how the algorithm controlled one building system lighting in relation to occupancy and renewables. So watch this light. If it's midnight, the solar is off and the occupancy is low. So no lighting is on. At six in the morning here, we can see that the lighting is being optimized because occupancy is medium, but solar is low in our dashboard. At noon, and I'm gonna hurt myself here, uh, <laughs> occupancy is high and solar is high. So lighting systems or any systems can run at full bore. And that's in a nutshell how it works. Sorry, folks, I gotta figure out how to get my presentation to run again here. All right, we will view. This is always the fun part of learning this stuff on the fly. All right. So Kim and Glenn typify the building operators and experts that we talked to that said they wanted cheaper, simpler, smarter, and autonomous controls. Fortunately, we have a long track record working in that industry, and we have some partners here. Um, Snowpud, about you're going to, I can say this publicly, um, but you'll see the press release soon. We're going to be doing this with um, schools in uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy and Avista. And our intention is to try and work to make these solutions more broadly available to small municipal K through 12 college campuses at a price that they can afford in the next, I would say by 2024, 2025, in part to be ready for some of those dynamic pricing signals. This is our team. You can see a women led team. So, you know, we've seen some stuff. And as our founder, I've personally been dedicated to scaling social impact and environmental impact since the early 2000s for schools, commercial building owners and communities. And my passion is taking energy innovations and making them affordable and accessible for wider demographics and bigger impact. None of us wants to live through another summer like the one that we just had. And I know many of you are looking for tangible ways to solve climate change. So I would say, I'm gonna make a plug on this call. We're also looking for pilot partners, advisors, and folks that we can work with to expand the reach of our technology and prove out the value proposition. But I'll leave you with this thought. Beyond economic and climate impact, buildings are part of the very fabric of human life. Now more than ever, we spend most of our lives in buildings. Our children are playing in buildings. Our parents are aging in buildings. And software and machine learning have revolutionized nearly every aspect of our lives. They have the power to positively transform our built environment. And I'd love to hear more from you about how you can join us, either as a fellow entrepreneur, as an investor, as a pilot partner, or just as a fan in harnessing their potential for good in the fight against climate change. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for that. Um, that was excellent. Next, I would like to welcome Ryan Brajas, a senior project manager at SMUD. Ryan is part of the customer and community group at SMUD and is the project manager for SMUD's e-commerce site, the SMUD Energy Store. Ryan also supports SMUD's community energy services group, consulting community choice aggregators in California as they launch customer programs and services. In his role on SMUD's energy store, Ryan leads the daily operations, planning and execution of product enhancements and strategic partnerships. Most recently, Ryan has helped Silicon Valley Clean Energy develop and launch their eHub website, which engages customers in the adoption of clean energy and electrification. So welcome Ryan and take it away and share your screen when you're ready. Awesome. Thank you, Thomas. And so I want to spend a little bit of time with you guys. Also, good evening, by the way. Thanks for joining. Uh, talking about SMUD's marketplace, why we decided this was a good idea to build, how we're using it, um, some of the things that we found particularly successful, and where we're going with this. So to kick it off, why did we think that this was something good to, to build for our customers? Uh, well, our customers said so. So we asked them, uh, back in 2014, how important is it that SMUD offers a tool like a marketplace? And 66% of them said is either very important or extremely important. So that was really where this vision kicked off. And so a marketplace also supports SMUD's segmented engagement strategy. We take a very segmented view of our customers. Um, and there's a particular customer group that's highly digital. They make up uh, almost a third of SMUD's residential base. They have a 6% five-year growth. And there are some stats on them here. They're very tech savvy. They're always on their devices. 
They want things to happen fast and automated. They want to be able to self-serve themselves, not rely on somebody else. They're on social media. They're interested in energy efficiency and managing their use. And they're willing to pay for products that help the environment. And so this is the key target that we wanted to focus on with the marketplace. So what is Smud Energy Store, our marketplace? And I'll just read the statement here. Uh, it's Smud's e-commerce site and digital transaction platform where our customers can shop the latest energy related products, receive exclusive instant rebates and discounts at checkout, access home energy resources, find contractors and explore a variety of programs and services. So the, the following slides go through kind of all these different pieces of our marketplace. The primary goals of Smart Energy Store are in, in no particular order, are improving the value perception of that key customer segment or segments, especially that digital one. We wanna be a trusted advisor in the community, especially as customers adopt new energy technologies. We want to engage our community and our partners who are focused on Sacramento's energy future, promoting SMUD's programs as well as our partners' programs and services. Of course, increasing the adoption of energy management and electrification project products and programs, uh, supporting carbon reduction goals for SMUD and the Sacramento region and the world really, uh, especially if you've heard of SMUD's latest zero carbon 2030 plan, uh, which is a vision of our, our newly appointed CEO, Paul Lau. Uh, and finally, we wanna implement a flexible, scalable digital platform that can be used across the organization. So Smut Energy Store uh, has had some success. It's one of the top utility marketplaces in the nation. We've sold close to $5 million in products. Uh, all these stats are in the last three years. We launched this in October, 2017. So almost 5 million in product value sold over 60,000 items. Eight, over 18,000 of those are thermostats that are prime for demand response, which will be key in our carbon goals uh, for next year and beyond. Uh, we've had 46,000 customers claim instant rebates on the site. Uh, we're constantly iterating and improving this. Uh, we've done over 100 enhancements from new products added, optimizing the user experience, adding new features and tools that our customers can use. Uh, 820,000 site visitors, 20% of those are returning, 15% are repeat purchasers. So we're seeing some fantastic engagement on the site and people are happy. We have an 89% average customer satisfaction rating. Uh, for context, about 80% is what uh, a target is. And over half of our customers are aware of Spend Energy Store, which again is uh, particularly high. So very proud. And on the pride note, um, SMUD was named the SEPA Public Power Utility of the Year last year. And it was mainly because of the expansion that we've done with SMUD Energy Store, the marketplace beyond uh, industry norms, what other utilities are doing. Uh, we've utilized the platform to provide energy efficient products to our low end communities uh, at free or reduced prices. And also we've partnered with a lot of uh, organizations, uh, the biggest one being City of Sacramento Department of Utilities, the water district to deliver rebates on their sprinkler system program. And I'll go into detail on that a bit later. So very proud of it. This is something that's got a lot of attention uh, and it's something that our customers have, have grown to get used to and really love. So here's a screenshot of Cement Energy Store. Uh, in a nutshell, customers can shop energy related products and explore different resources, like I mentioned. So uh, on the right is a zoom in on the navigation. Uh, and so different products we offer today, thermostats, smart home, which would be cameras, sensors, uh, uh, smart speakers, um, uh, lighting, uh, water fixtures, air quality, power strips. And this is constantly growing uh, based off of products we feel are important and also products that our customers are requesting from us. So it's a, it's a constantly growing and shrinking list. Uh, we're, we're always optimizing and making sure we're carrying the best products. And then there's also the resources section. So if a customer wants to know, well, what can I do around my house to make it more efficient or to electrify in these different categories, they can explore uh, tips and tricks and also figure out what sort of programs, rebates, and incentives SMUD offers in those areas. Uh, and then also some green type of uh, tips with EVs, solar, um, and our, our green energy programs and whatnot. So that's, that's SMUD Energy Store in a nutshell. Uh, the biggest value of SMUD Energy Store, what customers really like the most is that we offer instant rebates. So historically, uh, the rebate program, and you all are probably familiar with this, that you, know, you buy a thermostat or a product that's available for a, a rebate, 
and you have to submit the receipt on an online form or God forbid, mail it in uh, and then wait, you know, weeks or a month to get a check in the mail. So with Cement Energy Store, we flip that on its head and say, no paperwork, don't have to do anything. You just have to check out and you'll get your rebate right at, right at uh, checkout. So how it works is you add a product to your cart, just like on any e-commerce site. You click this apply instant rebates button in your cart. It takes you to a screen where you can enter your service address, your spent service address or your account number. And then it validates yes or no, you are a spent customer uh, and you have to ship the product to you, this, the address you validate against. You agree to terms and conditions and then the product, the, the rebate gets taken off right inside of your cart. So you can see the minus $50 here for the smart thermostat and you check out as normal. So super simple, super clean, no work need to be done after the fact. Uh, and, and our customers have really loved this. Uh, so instant rebates, that's a, that's a, a big thing. Uh, you know, we're also very conscious of this platform that we've created and how we can use it across the organization. Uh, we wanna support the delivery of electrification and decarbonization and other programs that are becoming more and more prevalent, especially with the new 2030 clean energy vision. Uh, we have the sale of these smart thermostats, EV chargers, and those can be leveraged for future demand response programs. Again, those are things that are gonna be more and more important as we move into next year. Uh, and on that note, we can actually enroll customers in these demand response programs all in one transaction, maybe even offer an additional incentive to participate in a demand response program. Uh, and so that can all be done in one transaction on Smart Energy Store. Uh, we wanna reduce operational costs of delivering these programs by going digital and automated. We no longer need uh, people to spend time uh, processing rebates and entering them in systems and processing checks. Uh, we're becoming much more nimble with this automation. We're offering added value to our low income customers and in many cases, some of our business customers as well through free or discounted products. We're improving customer satisfaction on those key customer segments. I mentioned that several times now. Um, that digital customer segment that I said makes up a third of Smud's residential base is actually 43% of our order. So we're over indexing on serving that target customer, which is fantastic. And then of course, bundling education and action into this streamlined experience this familiar platform, a single platform uh, that our customers know and love. So we do a lot of marketing to get the word out on Smart Energy Store and keep our customers engaged. This is an example of you know, some emails and digital ads, bill inserts, um, billboards on the side of the freeway, uh, the light rail wrap there. You've probably seen some of these if you drive around um, Sac State or up on, on I-5 on the billboards. Uh, so we, we do a lot of work to, to keep it fresh, to get the word out, to keep customers excited and engaged. And then there's also a lot of sales and promotions that generate buzz and spike engagement with the store. So uh, these are largely um, done around seasonal uh, efforts. So 4th of July, back to school, uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, of course, uh, or the springtime when we do a, you know, a water campaign and uh, that drives a lot of excitement and traffic. Some low income customer outreach we've done, uh, free holiday lights, free water saving products, free air filters. Uh, these are some examples of, of customer communications that have gone out. It's been in the form of email and the form of physical coupons that our uh, energy specialists will take with them when they go to customers' homes to help them uh, become more efficient. And so we've had over 6,000 customers redeem their free or highly discounted product um, through this low income offering. And one of the biggest things that differentiates Smart Energy Store from other utility marketplaces and something that I'm really excited about is uh, how many partnerships we have. And these are local, regional, uh, even national partnerships that uh, add value to the customers. Uh, these are exclusive offers, co-marketing partnerships, uh, and some, you know, regional water authority, the city of Sac, uh, the Kings, Habitat for Humanity of Greater Sacramento, all of these partnerships um, have uh, worked towards a common goal, uh, engaged customers and added some sort of value. And so I wanna go through several examples really quickly of some of the, of the recent partnerships. The first one is the city of Sacramento, uh, Department of Utilities, the water district. Uh, they offer up to $400 off uh, smart irrigation upgrades. 
And it just so happened that we're selling these smart irrigation controllers. It's pictured there on the bottom right. And so I approached them and said, hey, you, know, you guys have this program. People can actually get it for free. $400 more than covers the cost of the unit. And uh, it even includes $150 towards installation costs. So it's essentially free to customers. And I said, hey, what's your, what's your program participation been like? We sell these products on the store. Maybe we can offer an instant rebate. We can be a marketing arm for you guys, uh, do some co-marketing activities. And so when we, we launched the instant rebate for City of Sacramento water customers on Smut Energy Store in October, 2018, uh, in the chart here you can see FY19. Uh, and in the, those three months at the end of 2018, uh, we more than doubled the program participation uh, for that smart sprinkler controller program. And since then we've done uh, close to 3000 units of these smart sprinkler controllers that customers can get for free. They get up to $180 off instantly, which brings the, pro the price down to like 30 or $35. Uh, and then they can install it and have the city come inspect it after the fact, and then they can get the rest of the costs covered. And so it's free to the customers. Uh, this is a super easy and fantastic way to deliver the program and the partnership. And we also offer, uh, um, shower heads and aerators um, that the city also rebates through Smart Energy Store. So in total, we've done close to 4,000 rebates claimed in the last couple of years with the city and, and it's only growing. The next example is a, the Waterhawk Smart Showerhead Partnership. So the Waterhawk, this was created by a SMUD family during the 2015 drought. Uh, and this particular showerhead promotes behavioral water savings through uh, you can see it in the picture there. There's an LED screen in the middle uh, that shows you real-time water usage and the water temperature and illuminates with certain colors depending on water temp. Uh, no batteries are needed. It's powered by the flow of water. Uh, and we've built this website on smud.org that you see there pictured uh, and also have a, an exclusive discount on Smud Energy Store for the product. Uh, we did 600 units in the first couple months with a half off promotion and since April 19, uh, we're close to 1,200 units sold uh, for uh, Ty McCartney and his wife, who, who are the ones who launched this product. So a really neat local partnership that we've done, help a local company uh, get some you know, water savings measures in customers' homes. It's a good story all around. And the final one, which is actually live right now, is this partnership with SMUD's Energy Help Program and Habitat for Humanity of Greater Sacramento. So. During November and December, for every unit sold uh, on Smud Energy Store, we're going to donate $10 to Smud's Energy Help Program. Uh, and I've got a description here of what that is. It helps recipients pay their electric bill, access additional services such as food, clothing, job training, childcare. Uh, a really nice offering that Smud's had for years. Uh, but is it particularly important this year when you know, so many people are getting laid off uh, and, and having struggles with? Uh, simple things like keeping food on the table, clothing their kids. So we wanted to do something to give back to the community this year. Uh, so we're donating to that program. And then for every power strip sold in, in November and December, we're gonna donate a power strip to Habitat for Humanity of Greater Sacramento so they can outfit the homes that they're building for the disadvantaged families uh, with these um, power strips that can help save energy. So what's next for Smart Energy Store? Well, it's our e-commerce site. So as you can imagine, we of course wanna grow in sales and engagement. Um, we want to have special offers for targeted customer groups like city Sacramento water customers or low income customers or any other types of customers. Uh, we wanna improve the customer experience, whether that's through optimizing the, the on-site experience, uh, the email communications, uh, reducing any common complaints that we, that we get from customers. We track those very closely. We wanna optimize the marketing, especially with email and paid search and social. So increasing the conversion rate, making sure that we're putting out a variety of messages. It's not getting stale. We wanna keep the customer excited uh, and then appropriately targeting them, uh, knowing if a particular customer is interested in EVs or solar or thermostats uh, and making sure that we're, we're delivering the message at the right time. Uh, of course, growing the existing partnerships and then establishing new partnerships that add value, you know, I gave example of three and we've done dozens of them that have all been fantastic. Adding new products that customers want and that support SMUD's goals 
Uh, we talk a lot about electrification, whether it's induction cooking, heat pump water heaters, heat pump HVAC. We wanna add large appliances. Um, if any of our community partners have particular interest in being part of this, we wanna add products that support their goals. And then other ongoing tech that pops up throughout the year that becomes popular uh, related to energy, energy management. Supporting some programs. So uh, EV charging is something that is top of mind right now. Uh, managing, uh, managing charging, electrification, appliance recycling, and then just general education. We want to, uh, we want to support all SMUDS programs through this platform. And then experimenting with different ideas. Uh, earlier this year, we launched an air filter subscription service. Uh, and we're talking about how we can offer large appliances in partnership with some local retailers. Uh, you know, you it's hard to ship a refrigerator that would cost uh, a lot of money. But if we can partner with uh, different uh, local retailers to sell these uh, heat pump water heaters, uh, induction cooktops, and get them delivered to customers' homes, that's something that is, is definitely top of mind for us. So that's my energy store in a nutshell uh, and the end of my presentation. So I'll stop there. All right. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to the panel discussion led by Gary Simon. Yeah, well, first of all, um, let me just ask that Karen, Tanya, and Ryan take a look at what's been going on in the chat room because there's a lots of questions in there uh, that people are looking for some specific input on. So um, if, if you could answer those as we're going through the conversation here, that would be great. But let me start with Karen. Um, a lot of the research that you were commenting on was, was from a few years ago. What's hot right now? What are you working on right now? And, and what do you see from the 2020 and 2019 experience on the really hot days when, when we had the, uh, the calls for uh, extreme conservation to, to get us through the peaks? Um, so what's at the top of your list on experiments you might be running now? Well, um, like I said, I'm in a two year uh, limited term position at the California Energy Commission to work on their load management standards, which I'm happy to talk about um, anything that's public there. Um, in terms of, you know, what's hot in pilots and research, um, there's currently, um, a, you know, a lot of work on connected communities, for example, at the Department of Energy, even the EPIC research. Um, is reaching out and looking at how, how can we use all of the technologies that we have. Um, somehow the grid isn't keeping up with, with what's available. And, and we have lots of, you know, the internet of things is there. And as um, Tanya suggested, there's, there's opportunities for um, not only FM, but also uh, cellular broadcast of rates and signals. And so I, I think right now people are trying to figure out what is, what's going wrong with what we have now. Why aren't demand response programs working and how can we make it um, more organic? Uh, at the Energy Commission, I'm really focused on getting a database of of rates, time varying rates, initially time of use rates, because that's what we have. Of course, um, someone mentioned tiered rates and they don't like tiered rates and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, luckily, uh, the good news is those are going away. We're moving from tiered rates to time of use rates um, because everybody knows what time it is and very few people know where they are, uh, how much energy they've used over their, their bill. Um, so, you know, in, in order to make time of use works, time of use work well, yes, people can manually change their thermostats and other things, but none of us, I think, want to do that. So unless we have a, a database of rates that's machine readable, there's no way we can automate um, response to time of use rates uh, well. And then going forward, if you've been watching what's happening at the PUC, and of course, it's also referenced in the load management standards at the Energy Commission, the California ISO is very much behind um, real-time rates, hourly rates, 15-minute rates, five-minute rates on, an, on a voluntary basis for customers mm -hmm. who can um, manage it, who do have the automation to respond, um, they can save a lot of money on their bills and they can really help us get to that carbon-free um, grid uh, by 
So it sounds like there, there's still a fairly large frontier of more things that could be done. You certainly emphasize the communication Absolutely. gateways um, and that whole technology. So we talked about, uh, in Tanya's case, using the cell phones. You did FM radio and the little Z-Wave thing that you had. Um, we talk a lot about business opportunities for clean tech companies locally that they might seize on. Is there a business opportunity in trying to come up with a better communications protocol and technology that would enable a lot of what you're talking about doing in demand response? Oh, I, I just want to say one thing about that, if I may, <laughs> which is there is so the, the lack of standardized data, um, you know, data characterization, uh, it, there, it's more than just the communication protocols that's an issue. We're not just using cellular, cellular. we can receive command signals from the e-radio format, for example, Wi-Fi, you can have a wireless mesh in the building, but part of the problem and part of the reason there's so, this is such a crowded space, actually. There are a lot of people trying to crack this nut, um, but they haven't been able to get the businesses to be scalable. And one of the big reasons for that is because of a lack of access to data, a lack of access to standardized control protocols. And so while we're not, you know, open ADR, I think is a step in the right direction, CTA 2045, which is native to the device. Um, and I know that the state of California will require on new um, heat pump water heaters in the state, as well as the state of Washington. Now all water heaters in Washington must include CT 2045. But even that can be, you know, tricky. So there's this real lack of interoperability at the device and the control signal level in a way that, you know, integrators, that's why only the biggest companies can afford this. They can pay a system integrator like a Siemens or a Schneider to do that integration, but on a smaller scale, it, it can become quite complicated. And vendors like Nest um, don't want you to control their customers' uh, experience. And so you have to pay them a lot of money to access their API in order to affect that control. But in the meantime, they're a walled garden. You know, I think the idea that everybody's going to have uh, a Samsung light and a Samsung uh, thermostat and a Samsung TV and a Samsung, you know, it's just, it's unrealistic. And with that lack of sort of standard communication protocols, control protocols, data taxonomy, it becomes kind of a tower of Babel. I don't know, Karen, if you agree with that, but um, I think that's one area where regulators could really help uh, in thinking about open standards and how that opens up communication. Right, yes. And, and that that is um, sort of the answer to Gary's question is that I don't know if there's an opportunity there. I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm working at the CEC to convince them that they have an opportunity um, to, to be that standards making authority. So the Energy Commission has load management authority in addition to their building uh, standards and appliance standards authority. We have load management standards authority, which um, we're using at this point to create um, initially a sort of a central repository or statewide system that will provide the data that's needed to um, for demand automation on a, on a mass market scale. And then following the load management standards, we have now the SB49 appliance standards that can take advantage of this statewide system. And I see a question uh, that I'm not entirely sure from Rob about um, balancing supply and demand over five seconds of the day. No, no. Um, so one of the things that's key in, in what I'm trying to develop with IT at the Energy Commission is um, that it's, it's really just a public notification of prices because the devices can't, can't manage load unless they get some kind of a signal. So the utility can control the load, which is what we're doing now, and it hasn't been very efficient. Uh, but if we have prices out there, uh, there is no control of the load. The customer makes a decision about whether they want to buy or, or not buy uh, electricity based on what the current price is. And so the California ISO remains the balancing authority. Um, the prices at the utilities now uh, ideally would net be tied to the locational marginal pricing of the California ISO. And given that those prices will now be 
centrally located in a public area, uh, devices, the, the, the business opportunity is to create the devices that help customers respond using that publicly available information um, uh, or to be a service provider to help them figure out what, what technologies they need to buy to make that happen. Well, well Tanya, uh, expanding a little bit on something you said uh, in your talk and, and sort of reflected on it here, you mentioned working with a utility owned microgrid uh, to deploy uh, some of the things that, that you talked about. Now, microgrid is the magic word in California right now. Um, what's that experience been like? I mean, I, several of us have talked in, in prior programs here um, on the advantages of the utility owning the microgrids. Others have been very skeptical of that. But um, do you have any insights into trying to deploy some of this demand management uh, activity, community energy activity at the microgrid level, and how does that integrate with what uh, the larger grid is doing in your experience? Oh, well, I will say that that microgrid was actually a community. It was a very innovative business model. So it was community and utility owned. So there were shared assets, shared ownership, and it was partially subsidized. So the problem is everybody loves microgrids until the bill comes. Um, and particularly if you're in urban areas, you know, so I have worked on both the utility side. Um, I was briefly before I took the IP from CEL, I was briefly the virtual power plant manager for Portland General Electric. And from the utility side, what I saw is, you know, for us, the biggest value proposition would be to take, for example, um, radial endpoints at a radial feeder that had reliability problems, maybe locate some grid scale batteries where they could island. You, of course, had to have communication, so you have to have SCADA. Um, and that you might have 40 of those in these really remote areas of the system where there's multiple benefits. And then you can aggregate those and use some of that excess at other times to optimize your power purchases. But short of that, um, you know, for resilience purposes, microgrids make a lot of sense. But if you're in a dense urban area, most utilities now are moving toward advanced distribution management systems, distribution automation, and sort of slicing the distribution grid into such small pieces that you're really not, you know, you're really not experiencing long outages, even during power safety shutoffs. And I was really sad to hear how many from the San Francisco Air Board, how, how many more permits they had to issue after power safety shutoffs for diesel genset um, backup generators. So I think there's a happy medium. Not everything needs to end in a microgrid. That island, I have a microgrid in my home actually, and it's not cheap. It's never going to pay for itself, even from a resiliency standpoint. I did that for uh, my own reasons. But I think there is something that I call it microgrid light. So I did hear from PG&E that they had, they were putting through the CPUC something called a load limiting tariff. So it was a large enough customer that customer wanted to add a significant amount of behind the meter generation, which when it went through interconnection, the utility said, eh, 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 that's going to require an infrastructure upgrade. Well, the customer said, look, what if we can manage it ourselves?" Um, would you be willing to just cut off power? So they put a relay out at the front of the meter that essentially sets the characteristics that they need to stay within in order to not trash the utility's infrastructure. And the customer, you know, manages their load behind the meter in order to stay within those limits. And, you know, I guess they, they felt that that customer was sophisticated enough that they could trust that they would be able to manage it without having significant reliability problems. But I think there is a whole host. When we looked at microgrids, we're like, maybe everybody will be on a microgrid at some point, but there is a process that we called lasagna that starts with deep energy efficiency, uh, demand response and automated controls at the building and community level, shared storage and generation resources, then control architecture, and then islanding. Um, but that's, microgrids are sort of like, you know, to say what is a microgrid is is like saying what is love. You know, they, they are really, um, they're very unique. And I know that it's become a very popular concept, but I think you have to, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so it's, what we did was a rural community, very isolated, uh, reliability issues, 
no backup for an emergency sheltering site. So there were, and then also there was research and development money through the utility. So I just wanna kind of say, love microgrids, but I don't think they're the only or even the best solution depending on the problem you're trying to address. Well, there's a couple of questions that have been raised about an off-grid situation, so somewhere where you're probably not close to a utility grid and the application of what you're trying to do with the community energy lab and, and others. Can you stretch out and talk a little bit about the applicability of what you've been doing to situations uh, where you would have an isolated off-grid situation that sort of is, it's an isolated microgrid, I guess you would, you could conceive of it that way. But uh, if I've not gotten the question right, Miriam and, and Rob will, will step in and help me phrase it better. But could you respond to the off-grid situation, the applicability of a lot of the techniques and approaches you're taking? I'm not going to call myself an expert on that. I, you know, I used to joke three years ago that if you've done one microgrid, you're an expert. But now I can't say that anymore because, you know, I think what California has at least 28 that I know of and, um, and the concept is expanding. I'm not an expert. You know, I've interviewed a lot of expert about, uh, about microgrids. I will say, you know, I like what Rob um, wrote in the chat that we're looking at remote grids and smart grids and microgrids, you know, microgrid meaning one that can island and there may be a really good reason for that. Um, uh, but there are other ways to isolate sections of the grid for greater reliability. I guess I, I don't feel 100% qualified to answer that question. Um, though, having looked at the Blue Lake Rancheria microgrid, which I'm sure many of you have seen presentations on, that seemed to me like a really excellent use case because you do have um, a community, you have equity issues there, they have reliability issues, um, they had sheltering that they wanted to address and in places where, for example, they might be more impacted by the power safety shutoffs, it seems to me like that might be a good use case for an islandable microgrid. Right. Well, Miriam, I think is going to follow up with you um, on the off-grid situation. So um, I, I expect a connection there, but let me turn to Ryan. Um, wonderful stuff on Smud's Energy Store. Um, and where might you be taking this beyond Smud's boundaries? Because, I mean, there are the community choice aggregators um, and certainly Silicon Valley Clean Energy being one of the biggest one of those. Are you, are you thinking of expanding the program beyond SMUD's borders or just being a template for others to follow? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. Uh, and, you know, the original vision for SMUD Air Store was to increase SMUD's uh, reach beyond uh, our territory. And so uh, looking at you know, nearby um, irrigation districts or smaller utilities uh, that we could serve is certainly something that we'd be interested in especially if they're uh, particularly resource constrained and can easily tap into uh, the platform that we've already got set up. The challenge is uh, SMUD, you know, it's kind of a funny name. And if you're not nearby, it might sound like, is that a real company? What is, what is SMUD? Never heard of it before. So that's, a, that, you know, the branding is a challenging challenge to overcome, but yes, I would love to uh, go beyond the borders of SMUD. Well, I mean, one of the most attractive features that you've mentioned there is the instant rebate, um, of course, of course. which does confound a lot of people when they have to fill out the paperwork and submit the receipts and all that sort of stuff. Have you thought about how you would handle that if you expand beyond the borders? And I don't know that the CCAs have set up um, rebate programs similar to what, what SMUD would have being a fully integrated utility, mm -hmm. but you've, you've probably got some notions on how you would make the the instant rebate program work for others? Yeah, the uh, I think the rebate programs are still in its infancy with CCAs. Uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy is in the process of figuring those out right now. Uh, and how do they offer value beyond what PGE is offering, you know? Uh, but if they were going to offer rebates of their own on a SMUD hosted platform, uh, it would just be a matter of being able to validate those customers. And so if SMUD had an ingest of their customer data to say, yes, customer X is or is not a CCA customer, uh, that would be the extent of, of the integration. All right, well, there's probably more things that are gonna develop uh, along that, but yeah. you know, great innovation. And I, I know you, that SMUD has been working on this for a year, but it sounds like 
all that hard work has has really paid off. Your your results on the amount of that you're selling now and and the the gain in the number of people who are connecting and trying it out is is really uh, right. quite pleasant. So congratulations on all that, Ryan, and and to everybody at Spud uh, for what they've done. Um, there is a conversation going on in the Sacramento community about um, focusing a community energy project in, in some disadvantaged areas um, in the Sacramento area. So I know Tanya, Karen, and, and Ryan will all be back with you um, to talk about how we could pull something like this off where it is a community-based effort and pulling together all the threads that, that, that exist out there. So that's just a heads up. But there are local governments on the call. Um, I will say that we just did a webinar the other day with Smart Blocks, which is an Oakland-based organization that worked on an eco block, so block-based connected communities, and the Climate Center, you know, as a policy-making nonprofit, which has been working on advancing state um, at the state legislature. Um, a bill that would assist communities in that technical planning process that we were talking about. So I'm looking to hand off some of the intellectual property that I received from PECI that won the award and helped that community build the microgrid to hand that off to those nonprofits. And so we're currently seeking letters of support from communities that want to have those planning resources so that we can go to funders and try to get that work funded and then hire through the local government commission, a civic spark fellow who can carry out that work on behalf of communities all over the state. Because you know, even Silicon Valley Clean Energy, which uh, issued an RFP for this planning process, this resilience, energy resilience planning process to get those portfolios of projects, I think their RFP was, you know, three hundred and forty thousand dollars, and they had to set aside, and a, a couple million for grants to the communities themselves for projects. And even that wasn't really enough to, and I shouldn't say it wasn't enough. That's plenty, but you know, most communities can't afford that level of investment. And a million dollars might sound like a lot, but it doesn't go very far. You know, the the microgrid in Tanina, which was a small one, was seven million dollars. So. Um, having finding sets of projects that solve community resilience and equity problems requires a planning process where lots of stakeholders are aligned with the folks that have the technical information like the distribution system planners and the local utility and Sacramento is obviously very lucky in that regard. Um, but if anyone wants to support that initiative, go to the Climate Center, Kurt Johnson, or contact me and I will put you in touch with those nonprofits as they're going out to seek funding for these types of resources for California communities. That's great, and and we I'm sure we'll have people that follow up and do that. But let me give Rob Ramal a chance to uh, chime in here. Rob, you've been putting a lot of good information into the chat. Um, can you give us some perspective on on what you've been talking about there um, from PG&E's point of view? Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate it, Gary. I appreciate being on the call. It's good to see JD Stack after 20 years. Um, <laughs> his picture. JD and I worked at Smud 20 years ago. I live in smud territory i'm a smud customer a smud fan but i work at pg e in san francisco and now with covid we're working from home we're working wherever we want to work and live where we want to work and you know combinations so tanya i really enjoyed your your presentation you know pg e has been the best and the worst <laughs> utility over time right with aaron brockovich getting us on the headlines and you know, being a notorious utility, we're, we're faced with so many challenges that it makes working for pg e probably the most rewarding career I could have ever asked for after SMUD. And SMUD was rewarding after closing a nuclear plant. So with pg e calling public safety power shutdowns to avoid uh, litigation and wildfires and catastrophes, you know, the issue of smart grid and decarbonization and all of these topics you're talking about are, are at the forefront and moving very, very quickly at the CEC, at the CPUC, and now with the new federal government coming in, in literally a few weeks, um, the Biden-Harris administration, I think, is going to put us all on a very exciting fast track. So hold on for the ride. We have a new CEO starting next month um, coming in from Michigan. 
We're hoping to reinvent ourselves. It's tough when you're a 23,000 employee utility. We're coming out of bankruptcy. We are you know, trying to trim trees, avoid fires, and deal with a lot of dead trees and drought. So a lot of tree mortality biomass projects, a lot of resiliency. I manage federal agencies, i.e. Uh, Yosemite National Park, Fort Mason, all of the national parks. So I'm ending my career living out in Yosemite at some point. And I really want to get everybody on board with fire resiliency, with the programs you've talked about, with demand response, because it's not gonna come from building new power plants. It's not gonna come from all batteries. You know, we're closing Diablo Canyon literally in three years. That nuclear plant is going away. So the CEC has a real challenge to plan for supply and demand, right? Every five seconds, we have to keep the lights on, whether it be the bank. The whole yeah. continuum of the power supply, you know, right. part of my day job, I mean, I'm a, so entrepreneur, which just means that, you know, I work 16 hours a day for- Yeah, and you are money. in a great spot up in Oregon. I'm yeah. in Canada, the Canada grid is owned by the crown. Right. Well, but, but the, the, my, so what I was going to say though, is that I've been working on resource adequacy for the Oregon Solar Energy uh, Association. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, this is, this issue of resource adequacy is going to require a portfolio of assets all, exactly. at every level, exactly. at every level of the system from our yeah. houses and ratepayers all the way up to uh, our generators because you yeah know, and everyone here. has to contribute what california and the us is known for is every county for itself every man for itself and at some point the grid has to be the western grid and it has to be where everyone's contributing to keep the lights on for everyone unless you want to go off grid and and disconnect from the grid and live a beautiful life you know in a tent with with, in California, you can do that weather-wise. In Oregon, maybe not so much. In Canada, you cannot live off-grid without freezing or you, know, you, need, you need to be connected. So you know, the Western grid, SMUD contributing to PG&E, PG&E contributing to SMUD, this is public power and private power at its best and worst to be able to come together with these solutions. So. You know, my rate friends at SMUD, I am constantly sharing information and seeking information to be, uh, to, to be the best in the state for the rest of the country to emulate and for Oregon and programs to be shared up and down the state. So with pg e we have a huge rate case that was just voted on by the commission today. You know, $13 billion of revenue requirement coming in for wires, for transmission, for generation, for public purpose programs, it's the whole gamut. And with CCAs, they have to step up with resource adequacy. If they're not planning for capacity and only providing energy, then PG&E has to back them up or someone has to step in to keep the lights on. And so that resource adequacy, Tanya, is the number one issue going forward over the next couple of years because solar cannot meet the resource adequacy needs over all of those hours, which is why we saw blackouts, you know, after the sun went down. So get ready for, I think, a lot of fun over the next couple of years. And I think Clean Start is right at the forefront in this city, in, in this county, to be able to lead the way on, on some of these programs in pg e territory, LADWP, Edison, uh, Pacific Power up in the north, Portland General in Portland. So I think it'll be a lot of fun. But thanks for the microphone, Gary. Yeah, absolutely, Robin. Thank you so much for those comments. And in a number of ways, we have another situation here of, of being confronted with insurmountable opportunity. Um, a lot of change is coming. But um, I want to thank the, the speakers tonight. Just fantastic. So we're going to put this out and tell everybody that missed this program, they, they need to come listen to it because this is the future. This is a lot of where some of the big gains are going to be made. So much appreciate what you've been doing, Karen. The data is so important. Tanya, what you've been doing in, in working with communities, obviously, 
Um, we're going to pick up on some of that work. And, and Ryan, gee, I've, I've never had a better explanation of what's going on with SMUD. I mean, I, I read the website and I try to follow everything on there, but you made it so much clearer. Um, it's too bad I live in Davis, but uh, maybe with PG&E's help, uh, we'll have similar things. And of course, there's Valley Clean Energy, so I shouldn't forget them. Uh, Thomas, uh, take it away and, and wrap us up here, but we're, we're at the end of our uh, on appointed hour. Big round of applause for Karen, Tanya, Brian, everybody. This has just been wonderful stuff. So thank you so much, everybody, for participating and, and for, for bringing such a good discussion to us. Thomas? Thank you very much. I want, thank you very much. I want to thank all of our presenters today, Dr. Karen Her Herter, uh, Tanya Barham, and Ryan Bruss. And I also want to make sure that we thank our overall program sponsors from EY, Momentum, GT Law, Reverent, and Hacker Lab, and our community of partners that help us um, build uh, Sacramento into a clean tech hub. So thank you for attending. I will try to have an edited video of this ready for everyone tomorrow to email out. And so you can check it out and share it on YouTube. Thank you very much and have a good time. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. It was a great session. Nice work. Great. Yeah.